Peter Blair Dennis Bernard Noon was a major part of the British invasion. Together with Herman's Hermits, they recorded music that was so friendly and hook-laden that we would sing the songs walking to school, in school, and everywhere else, just trying to duplicate Peter's accent. Today, 52 years later, Herman's Hermits' timeless music continues to make us smile, and Peter Noon continues to play to capacity audiences globally. Peter now has a program on Sirius XM 60s on 6 station called Something Good, as in I'm into something good. For everything Peter Noon, tour dates, social media, merch, and more, visit PeterNoon.com. Peter brings his show to Resorts Casino Superstar Theater on November 26th at 8 p.m. Tickets may still be available. Go to ResortsAC.com for tickets. Please welcome back to the Mark Berman Show, Henry VIII, the one and only Peter Noon. Welcome back. I am, I am, Mark. I am the one and only Peter Noon. Who discovered Herman's Hermits? Who discovered? Uh, you know, no, no one really, really knows how we we made it because we were just a hard-working band with, that played everywhere that we could play. We we became, you know, we were about 1963. We saw the Beatles in a field playing in a field, and we all decided that we would uh, quit school and quit jobs and go full, you know, go all in like in a poker game. Sure. And we put all of our resources into this group uh, that was called Pete Novak and the Heartbeats, and we eventually morphed, metamorphosized into uh, into Herman and the Hermits, which became Herman's Hermits. And um, we were dead lucky because we were all, I think I was 16 by now. The band started when I was 13, a band. And uh, by the time I was 16, uh, I was 16, Keith Hopwood and Carl Green were both 17, Barry Whitlam was 18, and our lead guitarist was 20, Derek Leckerby was 20. So, you know, we were very, very young and very, very fortunate because we'd chosen a type of music that no one else did. So we didn't have any competition, basically. You know, we were like a boy band before <laughs> boy bands existed. But we were a boy band who got ourselves to gigs. We didn't have a like a, a girl taking care of or a mom or anybody. We were just a boy band and, and we we had a huge following. You know, we we built up a following of, of girls and boys who liked the band. You know, that's in those days that's how it worked. And eventually we we got a record deal and luckily our record deal was with this guy called Mickey Most. Oh yeah. And he he produced the band, and Mickey was my best friend, he, you know, he was the best man at my married wedding, and he was my daughter's godfather, and um, he was like a life friend, and the one thing that we, one of the things that we had in common is we both liked the same kind of music, so in the studio we, we lived this sort of dreamscape where, where, you know, I'd say, you know that guitar sound on the Everly Brothers walk right back at the beginning, and he would know what I was talking about. So, you know, and I go, you know, what's the words from, you know, that deal? You know, I'm the type of guy who likes to run around. I don't know if that's all for around. When, uh, when I find myself, uh, that's the next line we didn't know, so we both didn't know it, you know. But, and, and it was just a great musical collaboration because we would never... Herman Simmons never recorded a song they didn't like. Oh. We just were there ready to go, oh, let's record that. That's a great song. Oh, let's. And Keith Hopwood wrote a song, and, and Derek Leckenby wrote a song. And we recorded them because, purely because we liked them. It wasn't. You know, and then it all, it all falls apart when somebody, when the lawyers or the accountants get involved. Because we're not, we're, we didn't realize we were supposed to get paid. Because <laughs> we weren't doing it for money. We only just needed to put gas in the van to go to the next place. And then, you know, managers and tax accountants and those, well, you need to set up a corporation and all that. Well, we, we, <laughs> we like it the way it is. And, and yep. then, you know, it all turns to every, to every version of an entertainer, you know, the actors, the singers, the dancers. The, eventually that moment comes where somebody says, wait a second, you're supposed to be doing this for money. And we go, no, 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 we're doing this. This is like my stamp book. You know, this is my hobby. And <laughs> if somebody wants to give me money for doing my hobby, well, great. But <laughs> we're not going to demand that. 
And, uh, you know, so we would, we would tour for years and years, never questioning the result. Except, were the audience happy and was it busy? So <laughs> I, they invite us back? <laughs> so I have to ask this. Uh, everybody, you're from the UK and I think you're from Manchester, aren't you? Yeah, Manchester. Yeah. You're not from Newton Le Willow, you're actually from Manchester. Yeah, there is, uh, there is a place called Newton Le Willow, yeah. Yes, I know, I've been there. Uh, oh, so, uh, so, did you play the cavern? Oh, lots, yeah. We, we, we were the popular lunchtime session bands. You know, they had junior sessions there, and we would play those. You know, we did everything that the Beatles did, Herman Sons did. We sort of copied their, um, you know, like the Beatles, apparently the Beatles would ask Brian Epstein, has Elvis done it before they would do anything? And we asked our manager, have the Beatles done it? Oh. You know, when they came to do a TV commercial in America for a, a soft drink, we said, have the Beatles done it? And they said, well, no. And they said, they said, we're not doing it. And our manager said, but it's like a million dollars. And said, yeah, but we don't want to do anything that, is, that, that the Beatles wouldn't do. <laughs> okay, so yeah. last year I had the opportunity to visit Mona, Bess, Mona Black's uh, Mona Bess Casbah Coffee Club in Liverpool. Have you played there? Yeah. You know, I don't think we did. I think it was already, you know, we, we, we played all around. We played almost all the dates. Of the, I think it was too small even for Herman Sonnet. So it was a very, very <laughs> tiny club. You know, yeah, it was we, in our we basement. Kind of, yeah, we had, a, we had a price level that, that it allowed us to fill up our van with petrol and get us home. And I don't think the Casbah could afford that. You know, we would have not. You know, sometimes like at the cavern, we could fill up the van and go there with petrol and fill it up on the way back yeah. and have money for, we'd go to a fish and chip shop, but we only had money for the chips. We couldn't have a fish. <laughs> so we'd just get chips, you know, and, and I don't think the Casbah would have even got us the chips. It was very small and, and different. We played the cavern. The, the shows we did were a cavern, Little and Town Hall, the Little Locarno. You know, just that next level. Sure. Oh, by the way, as a guest on the Mark Berman Show, all British musicians from your area do get a big bowl of bubble and squeak. Great. Great. <laughs> Our listeners are not sure what that is, but I no, just right. experienced that too. How many times did you play on Ed Sullivan's show? You know, I'm not really sure because he, he liked Herman Sermons. You know, he, he invited him. I went to Mass with him once at St. Patrick's. We'd be at Delmonico's in the morning at Ost. Delmonico's, that was that building he lived in, like a beautiful building on, on whatever street is the St. Patrick's Church. And I went with Ed Sullivan to Mass. And, you know, he, he liked Herman Sermons because we were kind of gentlemen. You know, we were very well educated for the position. We weren't kind of... Um, disrespectful like a lot of musicians were mm -hmm. at the time so so uh, he liked us and, and you know he liked the idea that we insisted to play live because it was just about that period when people were not wanting to play live because their records were difficult oh and uh, he let us do whatever we want we even did Jezebel on, on the, you know we did an old Frankie Lane song on the on the um, amazing. We, we let us do whatever we wanted. He kind of liked us, you know, because we were suited up and we were, you know, we called him Sir because we were just recently out of school, so we still knew that anybody who was older than us was to be called Sir. And you went to the Manchester School of Music, I believe. Yeah, and, and I went to St. Bede's College, which, which was um, like a good Roman Catholic boys' school. I didn't last long because I, I guess I got in fights with people, but... Um, you know, I was a, I was a, um, I was overeducated for the position of student. Oh, so, uh, I... <laughs> you know, I, I went to good schools and and learned from great people. You know, I, I speak French fluently because I had a French teacher, Father Murray, that I liked, and I'm, I'm good at music because I had a music teacher, Mr. Frost, that I liked, even though he made me get involved in music that I still don't like. You know, the <laughs> Lopez Bloomer, you know, all that German stuff. But you know, in the end. It all worked out good. You know, I, I, I've got a massive amount of uh, gratitude for whatever happened to me when I was a kid. We're in conversation with Peter Noon. We only have a couple seconds left. Where did you meet your wife? I met my wife at uh, the Bag of Nails, which is a club in London where 
she'd come from, I think she'd been living in Israel for a bit, and, but she was French. And I was from Manchester and I was in London. We were both there to see this guy called Jimi Hendrix, who was known to jump up on the stage and join the house band. And uh, there we were. We met in 1968, sometime early 1968. Over 20 years ago, I can tell you that. <laughs> wow. So you have longevity there. You have longevity in your career. By the way, one of my favorites of your songs is Everybody's Gotta Love Somebody Sometime. Uh, the original version, I, you know what? That's one of those songs you put on. You just want to feel good. I put that on. Uh, you've it's, appeared, a good, it's a good one, yeah. That's a real good one. We do that. We do that every day. You know, it's a, it's a great it's a bit of a, in every concert. You know, it's, heavy, it's one of those songs that means whatever you want it to mean, so I like it. Oh, I'll and hear that at resorts. There's a kind of hush all over the world is one of those songs as well that people go, oh, yeah, this brings back fond memories. Well, actually, like all your that. songs to me bring back memories, but, <laughs> I mean, you've had yeah. such an incredible, incredible list. And, you know, people have them in their collection. They can also go on YouTube and see performances and stuff like this or on your website, peternoon.com. You've appeared on every type of stage and screen. Was it fun appearing on Broadway every night but Monday? Yeah, it was fantastic. You know, and... And because I learned a lot, everything that I am now are, are bits and pieces that I learned during this long career. You know, you learn to, and I learned how to not hold a microphone on Broadway. You know, I, I've never not been on stage singing without a microphone. And uh, you know, it was a, it was a big stretch for me that even though I'd been on stage before, I was always had something, you know, a bag or a briefcase or something, and there I was with nothing. <laughs> and uh, so, so you know, and it, and it made me. One of the thrilling things is I've never had a real job. I was a bit of a window cleaner. I was always a part-timer, you know, because I was in, in a band. And if you, when, as you know, when you start a band, you need 11 jobs just to support the band. Right. Because they're usually useless to the others at making money. So, <laughs> yep. so, so I had a job as a window cleaner, and I was pretty good at that. But when I was on Broadway, it was a first because every week they gave me a check. And it was all my money. All the taxes had been taken out, the Social Security. And that had never happened to me. But somebody had always given me a check that I had to share like 15 ways, you know, pay the driver, pay the band, pay the thing, pay the car, pay the manager, pay, you know, and then you've got, then you, I was like an accountant for the band. And suddenly this man comes up to me and hands me this envelope. I go, what's this? And he goes, it's your, it's your salary. I go, what's this? And it's, What's a W-2? What's a W-9? What's a, a, I'm English. And it was all done for me, and it was, a, it was a fantastic feeling of, wow, this is like working for a living. Because all I'd ever done before was play. But you then know, you play, went... You play music. You don't work music. You play music. You play songs. So it was, it was kind of great to be business managed by the employer. But you went from Broadway, and then... You were, or still may be, Paddington on As the World Turns. Yeah, you know, that was a good thing. I, I enjoyed so, you know, I enjoyed the people. I thought it was easy. I enjoyed soap operas. I thought it was easy. But you can't do that and another job at the same time. It isn't a part-time job. Those, those people on those soap operas are much more talented than we think they are. Because you have to... They give you 30 pages at 4 o'clock one afternoon, and you have to show up the next day and know all the words. I wasn't good at that. I was doing gigs at the same time. I was like playing in Atlantic City and then driving back to New York, and I was expected to know 30 pages of dialogue the next day. And then they'd say, we, we're not, we changed page 26. I go, oh my God, I'm still learning page two. <laughs> we have a very short time left. I have to ask you, I saw you as a kid, you were a kid. I was a kid. I was in the audience. You were on stage at Steel Pier. Do you have some memories of Atlantic City? Because you're here quite often. Well, you know, I have only fantastic fond memories of Atlantic City because that was the height of Herman's Hermits. And there was a guy, I can't remember his name. I think he had a Lebanese name, George somebody. Hammond. Took, George Hammond, yeah. He took care of Herman's Hermits like we were his sons. And, and he... He, they got some sort of old truck. They couldn't get us on the pier. They were too, it was the highest, you know, we beat Ricky Nelson as, as having the most people on the pier, on the steel pier. And 
we got a van and a load of policemen and we drove, it took us like about 40 minutes to get from the arrival at the Stoop Pier to the dressing rooms. And the audience was fantastic and out of control. And, and but at night time, he would take us to his house and we got to walk on the beach near his house. And he, and he rented the people's movie, I think, I can't remember which one it was, it was Help. And then he rented home and showed its own movie, like called uh, Hold, uh, When the Boys Need the Girls or Hold On. And, and he, he took care of us like we were his children. It was such a magical experience. And so we got to, be, and, and once I was in Philadelphia, and I, and I knew a cop, a police officer. And uh, I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, you know, Sarah Vaughan's playing in Atlantic City. And I said, oh my God, I would love to see Sarah Vaughan. And he drove me. He got his car, you know, a pop car. And he drove me to Atlantic City and we saw Sarah Vaughan. Really? When I was like 17, I couldn't even get in the place. But I was with a cop. Wow. And, you know, those are great, 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 great memories. Story. And it was a funky little place, you know, but it was Sarah Vaughan. You know, people... You know, people in show business have to expect that one day they're not going to be playing in performing arts centers and casinos. They're going to be playing in that bar around the corner. And it's like, you know, I tell people, oh, I saw Sarah Vaughan. And my thing was that, that there was a lot of entertainment going on in, in Atlantic City in those days, just like there is now, that you can't see anywhere else. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, Hamad got us into all this. We, we never, we couldn't go in a motion picture. We couldn't go to a cinema because we were like the biggest band in the world that week. So he bought us, he bought a cinema and took us in there. You know what I mean? It was eleven people at the thing, eleven people in the cinema because it was at two a.m. in the morning or something. And I found out that the Beatles did all that as well. You know, they got special showings and stuff like that. But it's a good memory for me. And the, and that horse jumping in the water, and then we were like completely. Remember, Herman Summits were tourists. We sure. knew nothing. We didn't know anything about America. We we grown up with cowboys and Indians. That's what we knew. You know, we thought if we did an American accent, it was probably going to be John Wayne. Right. So you know, it's pretty fantastic, and, and you know, every one of Herman Summits was such a fan of what I guess we call. Americana, we were such Yankophiles that all our heroes just happened to be Americans in every department. You know, all the musicals that we liked were American, all the songwriters we liked were American, all the, um, the rock and roll singers that we liked were American. We, none of us listed any English people as our inspiration. So coming to America was just fascinating for home so We were like in awe. You know, everybody in the band had somebody that they wanted, they wanted to meet. I wanted to meet Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, Jackie <laughs> Wilson, uh, and, and uh, uh, Derek Leckenby wanted to meet only Chuck Berry. I just wanted to meet Chuck Berry. And then he did, you know, we got to meet all these people. And we did a gig at, we did a gig at Atlantic City with Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh. But we never thought it would happen. We never thought we'd get a gig with Jerry Lee Lewis. The stage you're walking out on. At resorts, the Superstar Theater is Atlantic City's first casino. It's also a stage that had the biggest names of all time walk out on. If that backstage could talk, it would be just a, a Emmy-winning movie because uh, Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand have taken that stage, plus the biggest names in groups and bands. And now you are taking the stage. And for those in that audience, it's a beautiful theater with great acoustics. Everybody will feel like they're up on stage with you, and it's just a perfect venue for you, Peter Noon. Where are you living now? You know, I live part-time in Santa Barbara, California, and in London. I go backwards and forwards. But I don't vote in America. I only vote in England. Hey, look, uh, we just went through something uh, here in America, and the reason that it is so great that we have you on the show this week is with everything we've gone through here in America with this election and everything that went on with that, my audience needs a little bit of zen, and that's what this and you are bringing to our audience, yeah. which is heard here in South Jersey on WOND and globally on the TuneIn.com app. And so, Peter Noon, I loved having you on. My pleasure. It's always good to talk to you, Mark. Hello, this is Peter Noon, Herman of Herman Sermich. You are listening to the Mark Berman Radio.